The word carnival literally means to dispose of meat. This is because in Europe, in the Middle Ages, carnival took place right before the Christian observance of Lent, which lasts 40 days. You're not allowed to eat meat or any fancy foods during Lent, and they're not going to last for 40 days, so right before Lent is the perfect time to eat as much of your best food as possible. Thus was born carnival, the disposal of meat. And with such a grisly name, it's only fitting that there's a Ravenloft Domain of Dread which shares a name with that festival. I'm talking about the Ravenloft Carnival, and it's what we're going to discuss today. Welcome to PhD and D, everyone. I'm Dr. Bowers, and today we're going to discuss the Carnival, one of the older domains from Ravenloft, back from 2nd edition. Now, I've been a fan of this domain since back in the 2nd edition, so I was really happy to see it reappear in Van Richten's Guide. As with my other Ravenloft videos, we're going to talk about what this domain is, talk about some media that'll help us get an imaginative grip on it, and then sketch out an adventure. Our adventure will have three acts, and it will take PCs from level 6 through 8, meaning that they will finish the adventure at level 8, and with DM's permission, could level up to 9 at the end. But before we get to the influences or the adventure, what is the domain of Carnival? Well... Garish flyers appear before the carnival's arrival, promising marvels, terrors, and a brief escape from the gloom of daily life. But the carnival does not exist to entertain its visitors. It exists in order to abduct those who belong with it, and to kill those who don't. This is true, despite some of the performers' good intentions, since the carnival is forever pursued by evil forces. The longer it tarries in one spot, the more chaos and misery it sows. Unlike many Ravenloft Domains of Dread, and like the carnivals it was inspired by, the Ravenloft Carnival is a traveling domain. It can appear in any campaign setting or world, and can even appear in other Ravenloft Domains. The apparent leader of the carnival, an elf named Isolde, seems to have good intentions. She wants to save people who are outcasts, and to punish people who bullied them. Unfortunately, Isolde is influenced by the carnival's true master, a sword, an evil intelligent sword named Nepenthe. Nepenthe twists Isolde's good intentions into spitefulness, jealousy, possessiveness, and wrath. So let's discuss some media to help us get an imaginative grip on this place. The first media source I would recommend for thinking about the Ravenloft Carnival is Geek Love, a novel from 1983 written by Catherine Dunn. This is a novel about carnival attractions, or people who are carnival attractions, but it doesn't feature such merry imagery as big top tents and ferris wheels and clowns or anything like that. Instead, it's about a family, the Benewskis, whose parents deliberately expose themselves to radiation and dangerous drugs during pregnancy in order to make sure that they give birth to monsters. These monsters serve as human attractions and a carnival, but what this novel is mainly about is oppression and cultish worship, as one of the members of this family, Arturo Benewski, the human seal, a man who has flippers for limbs, creates a kind of cult that worships him, and the cult members are prompted to remove their own limbs in order to become more like him. It's absolutely horrific, it's absolutely delightful, and it's a source you can use to get a feel for what the carnival could be like as an oppressive, abusive, insular society of outcasts. The next source I want to recommend is the 1983 film Something Wicked This Way Comes, based on the novella by Ray Bradbury. I think the film is just as good, if not better, than the novella, and it does a very good job of presenting a carnival as a source of mystery, wonder, and danger. Perhaps your version of the carnival abducts people and turns them into children? possible. A similar vibe can be found in the 1987 children's book Dr. Dredd's Wagon of Wonders by Bill Britton. It is a kid's book, so it's rather short with simple language, but it features a fun little tale about a dangerous and accursed carnival captained by an evil dread lord who comes and visits a town. It has a similar feel to Stephen King's work Needful Things. I also highly recommend the 2014 literary anthology Nightmare Carnival, edited by Ellen Datlow. Every story in this anthology is absolutely inspiring, and every single one has a different way of making a carnival seem horrific, mysterious, magical, and frightening. Likewise with the 2021 literary anthology, Welcome to the Fun House. The stories in this second anthology, I think, are a little more heterogeneous. They're a little bit more scattered in their themes and their tone. I particularly like the story called The Viperess of Las Cruces by C.W. Blackwell, and I think you could make a one-shot just out of that story with the carnival. I also, of course, recommend the original second edition Ravenloft campaign setting document, Carnival, by John Mangrum and Steve Miller. 
Many of the characters which appear in the Van Richten's Guide version of Carnival also appear in this core setting book. In addition, however, the core setting book also has a couple of short adventures that you might try running. And we're going to draw from a couple of those when we sketch out our adventure. And finally, a word about the 2022 campaign setting Hecna by Hit Point Press. A lot of people have mentioned Hecna in the context of running a Ravenloft Carnival adventure. And let me just say this. Do not strip Hecna for parts. I have recently run Hecna in its entirety, and I have to say it is one of the most thrilling, entertaining, creative, and satisfying 5th edition campaign adventures I have ever run. This is not a paid endorsement, it's not an ad, it's not a commercial, it's just a really amazing 5th edition campaign horror uh, adventure. It's something that you should run, not strip it for parts. Furthermore, I think Hecna could be its own Ravenloft domain in its own right, even if not officially, sort of headcanon-wise. And I'm going to do a video on Hecna in the near future. Additionally, while the theme of Ravenloft's carnival is sort of 19th century masquerades, covered wagons, and uh, sideshows, Hecna is more focused on 20th century Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey, Big Top Circus stuff with rides and games and popcorn and red-nosed clowns. The themes and the tones overlap, but they are distinct. So while I heavily recommend Hecna, do not strip it for parts just to run a carnival campaign. You don't need to do that. Instead, we're going to strip and twist around the parts of the Wild Beyond the Witchlight Chapter 1. More specifically, we're going to take the first chapter of The Wild Beyond the Witchlight, take its elements, and replace them with similar elements from the Ravenloft Carnival, either as mentioned in Van Richten's Guide, or as mentioned in the original 2nd edition Ravenloft campaign setting book. In addition, we're going to replace the plot about Mr. Witch and Mr. Light and Kettle Steam and all that stuff with a plot about Professor Pakali treacherously trying to betray and defeat Isolde, the leader and apparent lord of the carnival. We're also going to scale up the encounters and add a few more, permitting PCs not only to start at a higher level than one, but also to level up a couple times. As I mentioned earlier, this adventure takes PCs from level 6 through level 8. This means they will complete the adventure at level 8 and could level up to 9 at the end, with DM's permission. The adventure is also divided into three acts. Each time the PCs witness a carnival event and then attend three attractions, they go forward another act and level up. Because the PCs can visit the carnival attractions in any order, we're not assigning any particular attractions to any act. Instead, the acts will be distinct by how difficult those encounters become and what else is going on in the background. In Act 1, the PCs arrive at the carnival, witness a parade, are given gifts, which turn out to be monsters in disguise, and then have the opportunity to attend three different attractions. During this time, they may be contacted by Professor Pakali, who has a particular offer for them. Act 2 begins with a big top extravaganza, a big show inside a tent. After that, the PCs can visit three more attractions, and if they're working with Professor Pakali, one of those attractions should actually be a visit to Isolde and her private wagon in an effort to steal something of hers. Act 3 begins with Professor Pakali contacting the PCs, either to check in with them or to make one hasty offer about his plan. Then the PCs have three more attractions they can visit. And finally, in the Ravenloft Carnival's twelfth and final hour, there's a big event in the Big Top, the crowning of the Carnival Monarch. The PCs will face a boss monster at this event, and which boss monster they face is going to depend on what they did during this adventure. If the PCs proved cowardly in the face of the Carnival attractions, Isolde will scold them and summon an unspeakable horror to attack and eat them. If the PCs showed bravery or enjoyment, Isolde will welcome them to join the Carnival as permanent residents, and then attack them herself should they refuse. Finally, if the PCs cooperated with Professor Pakali, they face the wrath and danger of a demonic entity known as the Collar. Now, before we get started, we need to go over our versions of the Hour track and the Mood track from The Wild Beyond the Witchlight. There are a couple of differences. Our Hour track has 12 hours instead of 8, with scripted events occurring in the 1st, 5th, and 12th hours. Each scripted event takes exactly one hour, and each visit to an attraction also takes exactly one hour, for the sake of convenience and time tracking. Thus, for each one of our adventure's three acts, four hours pass. Three times four is twelve. Our mood track, however, has nine stages, just like the one from The Wild Beyond the Witchlight. 
Instead of having a sad side and a happy side, with the PCs starting out in the middle, however, there's a scared side and a fiendishly gleeful, evil-looking side instead, respectively. The PCs still start out in the middle. When they react to a carnival attraction with fear or disgust or disapproval, move them one stage further in the direction of fear. But when the PCs react to an attraction with enjoyment, move the tracker one step in the direction of the gleefully fiendishly evil. There's our version of the hour track and the mood track. With those out of the way, let's get started. The adventure and act one begin with the PCs arriving at the mist and shrouded carnival. The DM should mention that posters and flyers advertising the carnival's presence have appeared in odd places for over a week. Not just on posts and bulletin boards, but on the underside of toilet lids, inside closets, in private spaces where no flyer should be possible to put up without notice. And the DM should ask each of the players which strange location their PC found some flyer in. Now since the PCs start out in the carnival, they're already trapped there. If they try to leave, the mists will lead them right back to where they came from. Again, it's a domain of dread. The first thing that happens is the PCs are greeted by a parade of colorful yet ghoulish revelers. They look like denizens from Halloween Town in Nightmare Before Christmas. They're led by an enormous giant of a man named Hermos who gives each of the PCs a ghoulish gift. They look like the sorts of gifts featured in the song Making Christmas from A Nightmare Before Christmas. Once the parade passes, or as it passes, those gifts come to life and attack, revealing themselves to actually be polymorphed monsters. I would have them be a phase spider, a brain in a jar, a gibbering mouther, and also a handful of jack-o'-lanterns that hop around and snap and bite, but give each one the statistics of a wretched sorrow sworn. If the PCs accost Hermos or any of the revelers about being attacked by the monsters, the revelers are going to laugh and write it off and say that's just the nature of the carnival. No danger, no fun. And at that point, the PCs are invited to go and explore the carnival and its many attractions. After the PCs visit three attractions, Act 1 ends, the PCs level up, and they begin to hear a number of announcements for a big top extravaganza, a huge show inside the big tent. When it comes to visiting the attractions, it's useful if you can provide your players a map or at least a list of all these attractions. If I were to run this, I would take the map from the Wild Beyond the Witch Light, shift the color palette, edit the tracks, and then relabel the little bits all over. As for the attractions, let's list and describe all of them right now, and just understand that the PCs visit any three of them per act. We're just going through the attractions in the Wild Beyond the Witch Light, in alphabetical order as they do, and describing what we replace them with. First, the Dragonfly Rides. We're changing these to Tattoo Rides. The Illuminated Man is covered with all manner of living magical tattoos, which can fly free from his flesh and give rides to any number of carnival goers. These rides are dangerous, sometimes lethal, but very, very fun. Now, riding a living tattoo is just like riding a dragonfly in Wild Beyond the Witch Light. The main difference is that the DC of the animal handling check is 16, with failure resulting in a PC falling to the ground and taking 2d6 bludgeoning damage. And when PCs finish at this attraction, one of the living tattoos attacks a carnival goer and will kill them unless the PCs intervene. This tattoo has the statistics of a cloaker from the Monster Manual. Next up, the Feasting Orchard. We're replacing the Feasting Orchard with what we'll call the Geek and the Grinder. This is a fenced-in area full of undead vermin which dance around and caper to the music of an otherwise silent organ grinder. Most of the vermin are undead rats or undead ravens. Overseeing the whole thing is the geek. The geek challenges the PCs to see who can bite off the heads of the most undead vermin before getting sick. Each PC can bite off three plus their constitution modifier, and for each one thereafter, they need to make a DC-16 constitution saving throw, suffering 2d8 poison damage on a failure. If a PC can bite off the heads of 10 undead vermin, they win. The geek gives them a gothic trinket of some kind, and the PCs move on the track closer to the gleefully fiendish side. The geek reassures the PCs that you eventually get used to and even come to enjoy the taste. Next, instead of the gondola swans, we're going to have the blood boat. Amelia the Vampire, she's not actually a vampire, she's an ordinary woman with functional bat wings, we'll give her the statistics of a succubus, offers to pull the PCs in a coffin-shaped boat along the red waters of a lake, which she says is filled with blood. 
It's a gothic boat ride, and as Amelia takes the PCs across the Icker, she talks with them about the pointlessness of life, the purposelessness of the universe, and asks them about how anything could matter. If the PCs annoy her, she overturns the boat, prompting every PC to either succeed on a DC-16 dexterity save, or else fall in the blood, suffering 2d6 necrotic damage. If the PCs don't annoy her, however, she mentions a little bit of carnival gossip. Alti, the werehair, she says, has escaped, and is stuck in his bestial form. As a result, he's furious and dangerous. She adds that the only person who can ever calm him down in this state is Silesa, the snake. Speaking of, we are going to replace the Hall of Illusions from the Witchlight Carnival with the Hall of Fire. Inside the Hall of Fire, PCs can witness Charlotte, the Fire Eater, both breathe and eat flames. It's also the only place in the entire carnival where PCs can safely take an uninterrupted hour-long short rest. Be sure to tell the players that. Unfortunately, between the PCs and the interior of the Hall of Fire is Alti the Werehair, who has the statistics of a Lou Garou. He's very dangerous and will not let the PCs pass or enter the Hall of Fire. Not, at least, until he's been calmed down, and only Silesa the Snake can do that. At some point, if the PCs talk to him, he will ask the PCs if he can eat them, saying that, now that they're trapped in the carnival, it's probably the best fate they can hope for. Like the Witchlight Carnival, the Ravenloft Carnival also has a lost property booth. It's overseen by a resurrected undead skeleton named Mola. She tells the PCs that most of the property will never be reclaimed, either because the original owners died, or else because the original owners decided to join the carnival forever. If the PCs want to take something from the lost and found, insisting that it's theirs or just asking for it, they just need to succeed on a DC-16 charisma-based check. Intimidation, deception, persuasion. If they do, they get a gothic trinket from the lost and found. However, when they get this trinket, they also need to succeed on a DC-16 charisma saving throw, and if they fail, they become obsessed with the trinket and unwilling to part with it. We're going to replace the mystery mine with what we call the Hall of the Living Mirror. This hall features a stage on which cavorts a doppelganger. And the doppelganger takes a particular form, a well-dressed humanoid with a featureless, faceless head. Going by the title Question Mark, the doppelganger challenges each of the PCs to do something that he can't copy. To succeed at this task, PCs just need to make a DC 16 Charisma performance check. If they do, Question Mark happily awards them either a gothic trinket or maybe something a bit more useful, like a potion. Perhaps a potion of polymorph? Any PC who fails this performance check, however, must succeed on a DC 16 wisdom saving throw or else have nightmares for 1d8 days about being replaced by an imposter. Now, at the end of the attraction, right after the PCs have left the Hall of the Living Mirror, they're surprised and one of them is tackled by Question Mark. He tries to strangle them, and is in midway through transforming into them before other officials of the carnival pull him off. As they pull him off, they say, No, no, Mark, they're not part of the carnival yet. They don't belong to you. As for the Witchlight Carnival's Pixie Market, we're going to replace this with the Litwick Market, as mentioned in Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft. I imagine it as a market of gothic, moribund pixies. These pixies trade in bad and traumatizing memories including the final memories of people who have died. They won't sell these things for gold, only trade. Bad memories for bad. After the PCs have visited a while, the Litwick Market is attacked by fell fey creatures, just as is described in Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft. In this case, I would make it two Yeth Hounds, and for fun, let's say that each Yeth Hound is being ridden by a devilish, evil-looking satyr. When it comes to Silver Song Lake at the Witchlight Carnival, we're going to simply replace it with the Snake Pit, featuring Silesa. Silesa is a green-haired elf with slitted eyes and a forked tongue. She cavorts in a pit full of swarms of dangerous snakes, and also changes into many snakes herself to the delight of onlookers. As part of her performance, she asks each PC a riddle. Those who answer correctly are safe, but anyone who answers incorrectly must succeed a DC 16 charisma saving throw or be cursed for 1d8 days. This curse prevents them from eating anything but rotten or disgusting food. Now, if the PCs ask Silesa about Alti the Werehair and how to calm him down, she'll agree to do exactly just that, adding, Oh, it's so delicious when people are brand new to the carnival. In the place of the Witchlight Carnival's small stalls, we're just going to have one attraction, 
the Invincible Wooden Man. The star of this attraction, the Wooden Man, appears to be exactly what his name suggests, a man made out of wood, but he is very much alive. He has the statistics of a troll, but with maximum possible hit points. Standing with him is Tyndall, the amazing soulless man, so-called because he casts no reflection in any mirrored surface. And Tyndall tells the PCs that if they can defeat the Wooden Man in combat without using fire or acid, they win a prize. As for defeating him in combat, that just means reducing the Wooden Man to zero or fewer hit points. As long as the PCs don't use acid or fire, the Wooden Man will regenerate, and if they use acid or fire, well, Isolde's not gonna be happy about that. You might just skip right there to a boss fight. After the battle, whether they won or lost, Tyndall will give each PC a potion of greater healing. If they won, they also get some gothic trinkets. Next up is the famous snail race from the Witchlight Carnival. We're going to change this to the Race Track of Horrors, and it's run by one Professor Pakali, a top-hatted, spectacled, evil-looking man. This attraction is still a race with all the same rules, except we are replacing the snails with horrible, amorphous, multi-limbed, and tentacled monstrosities whose limbs protrude from in-between bars in cages and chains that they're wrapped up in and locked in. Like the snails, they move at a pace of 10 feet per round, but PCs can make them move forward even more with additional animal handling checks. The DC, of course, is 16, not 12. PCs who make a DC 16 perception check note that these horrible creatures that they get to ride are wearing scraps of what look like human clothing. A fact that Pakali excuses by saying that they used to try to dress the creatures up. A 16 insight check will reveal that there's something wrong with this explanation. Now, at the race's conclusion, two of the creatures break free from their confines and attack the PCs. We can say that one of them will be a Grick Alpha, and the other one will be a Zorn, or Xorn, or Shorn, the Earth Elemental Critter. I wouldn't describe it as being like an elemental, though. I would describe it as looking like a fleshy monster. After the fight, Pakali reassures the PCs that there's no worries about killing those two. The carnival has a steady supply of those things. If the PCs talk with Professor Pakali, and he'll try to be friendly with them, he will tell the PCs that they're trapped in the carnival, and that there's only one way to escape. That way to escape is to confront and overthrow the carnival's evil master, Isolde. Pakali explains that he has a plan to unseat her and to lead everyone to freedom. All that he needs is a little bit of help. He asks the PCs if they will be willing to go to Isolde's private wagon and distract her, and while distracting her, see if they can get a hold of one of her hairs. Maybe there's a comb or a hairbrush or something, and they can steal it and bring it back to him. Once he has one of her hairs, he will be able to cast an enchantment that binds her and confines her, and thereby frees everyone from the carnival. A DC 16 insight check should reveal that Pakali is either telling the truth, or at least thinks he is. There's no effort at deception on his part. If PCs ask, Pakali points them in the direction of Isolde's private wagon, and says that they should visit it during a time when they would normally be visiting an attraction. Just treat it as an attraction. If the PCs have this interaction before Act 3, he says that he will contact them later, and he does, at the start of Act 3. If, however, we get to Act 3 and the PCs still haven't interacted with Pakali, then at the start of Act 3 he will rush up to them and quickly tell the PCs his plan. That's what we're replacing the snail races with. As for Isolde's wagon, that's what we're replacing the staff area with. It's still a wagon, much like the wagon of Mr. Witch and Mr. Light, but it's just Isolde and her possessions inside. If the PCs approach in a polite or ingratiating manner and they ask if they can come in, Isolde will welcome them in and talk to them about the carnival. She'll ask if they're having a good time, invite them to make themselves at home, and talk a little bit about her past. She won't tell them the deep truth about her past, about the switching of masters between the two carnivals, or about what she really wants in life, or any of her deep traits, but still, DM should use the description provided in Van Richten's guide to characterize what sort of conversation she would have with the PCs. Now, if the PCs are helping Professor Pakali when they visit Isolde, then they can spot a comb or a hairbrush lying on some surface. They can steal it with a DC 16 dexterity sleight of hand check, and if they fail, Isolde angrily scolds them, forcibly teleports them outside her wagon, and then locks her wagon, making her and the interior of her wagon inaccessible for the rest of the adventure. Getting caught, of course, would move the PCs along the mood track towards Fearful. So those are all of the attractions in the Ravenloft Carnival. 
Again, at the start of Act 1, PCs witness a parade, get a set of toys that turn out to be monsters in disguise and which attack them, and then they can go to any three of those attractions. Once they visit three of them, the attractions close down and everyone starts advertising the big top extravaganza, the show in the big tent, and that's where the PCs should go as they reach level 7 and proceed to Act 2. Act 2 begins with a big top extravaganza in the carnival's fifth hour underneath a huge and colorful tent. Tyndall, the amazing soulless man, introduces the attraction, an enormous two-headed clown named Urgle Gurgle. Urgle Gurgle has the statistics and an appearance of an Etin giant, albeit with maximum hit points and dressed up like a clown, and he's supposed to juggle and tell jokes. Unfortunately, as soon as he walks out into the ring, one of them, either Urgle or Gurgle, one of the heads, freaks out and goes on a rampage. What follows is a version of the encounter called Argument from the Nerdarchy book Out of the Box. It's an Etin disagreeing with itself. One of the heads wants to murder and does murder audience members. The other head doesn't want to murder them and is trying to help them escape. PCs can intervene in this event as they see please, either trying to talk Urgle Gurgle down or fight him, but if they don't do anything, lots of audience members are going to get murdered, and we're definitely moving that mood track towards sad. After the big top extravaganza, the PCs have three more hours, that's three more attractions that they can visit, and since it is Act 2, we're actually going to increase the DC associated with every skill check for the attractions by one. After they visit three more attractions, the PCs reach level 8, and they proceed to Act 3. Now, Act 3 begins with Professor Pakali seeking out the PCs, either to check in with them about any shared or mutual plans, or to meet them for the first time and hastily communicate his plan to them. After that, the PCs have three more hours, that's three more attractions they can visit, and then it's time for the ultimate event in the Ravenloft Carnival, the crowning of the Carnival Monarch, which again takes place in the Big Top. Now, inside the Big Top, for the crowning of the Carnival Monarch, Isolde and Tyndall announce the PC's fate. If the mood track is on the fearful side, Isolde scolds the PCs, tells them what they did wrong, how they defiled and disrespected her carnival. At that point, she summons an unspeakable horror to attack them. If the mood track is on the gleeful side, however, Isolde informs the PCs that they've done very well and that they truly belong at the carnival. They're welcome to join the carnival now, and stay with the carnival forever. Should the PCs refuse this generous offer, she will attack, probably aided by at least two of the carnival performers from the attractions. And with these old wielding Nepenthe, this is no joke. Finally, if the PCs have been helping Professor Pakali, Isolde starts to announce their fate, but is interrupted by Pakali walking into the big top and casting a spell. The spell creates a cage of fire around Isolde, and with it, a pentagram made of fire on the ground nearby. Out of the pentagram arises a shadowy figure in a top hat and cloak, accompanied by a handful of sturges. This creature is a demon called the Collar, Isolde's nemesis. We're going to give the Collar the statistics of a relentless slasher, and as soon as he arises from the pentagram, he kills Professor Pakali, and then turns to the PCs. Isolde remains in her fiery cage. She cannot be released. Although DMs might want to give PCs a way of releasing her and making her an ally for fun. If she's released though, she should not be able to kill the Collar. The Collar should escape because part of Isolde's curse is that she can never actually vanquish him. But regardless of which boss fight takes place during the crowning of the Carnival Monarch, it concludes either with the PCs' deaths or with the end to this adventure as chaos begins to ensue. The big top tent gets blown open by powerful winds. Snacks and gothic trinkets are rushed up into the air everywhere. Even audience members rise up into the air. Shadow fell mist floods everywhere, obscuring the area from sight. And the carnival itself, along with the PCs, are blown away into the mists of the shadow fell. On to their next adventure. So that's our adventure in the Ravenloft Carnival. What do you think? There have been a lot of demands for taking the Wild Beyond the Witchlight Carnival, but twisting it in some way in order to make it gothic and spooky and the Ravenloft version. Do you think this did well? What would you have added or taken away? Let me know in the comments. Thanks very much. Don't forget to do all the internet things. Click like and subscribe, and don't forget to hit the bell icon so you get notifications about videos whenever I upload them. I've got another couple videos soon, and a big announcement for Halloween, so stay tuned for that. And in the meantime, thanks.